Great. Good afternoon. And on behalf of the EMG, a very warm welcome to the Stockholm Plus 50 Roundtable Nexus Dialogue Series. My name is John Scanlon. I'll be moderating our two sessions today and also this time next week. And I'll outline what's involved in these sessions in a little while. I'm delighted to be back here at International Environmental House in Geneva, where I worked for eight years, and to be with Hussein Fadeh and also Janika Pitkanen there beside me, along with other colleagues from the EMG. Um, as you know, moderating sessions online can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge, a little bit more challenging than when we meet in person. But it's great to be in the presence of good friends and colleagues here in International Environmental House. And together with our panelists and discussants, we will do our very best to make this as engaging and interactive a session as is possible. Now we've got two hours set aside today uh, for the dialogue, and we're going to hear some opening statements. Then we're going to hear from our panelists and discussants. And then if all goes according to plan, we will have some time for an open question and answer session towards the end. Now in this context, please note there is a question and answer section in Zoom and feel free at any time to send through a question that you may have. Um, and also, if you like a question that you read, be sure to like it, uh, because those questions that get the most likes bubble up to the top and are more likely to be asked. Uh, we have a good colleague in New York who's managing this Zoom call for us, Nina Arden, and she's going to be keeping an eye on questions as they come through and will be feeding them through to us. Now, as I'm sure most, if not all of you know, UNEP is the Secretariat for Stockholm Plus 50, and the Executive Director serves as the Secretary General of the conference. And the EMG is going to be contributing towards the preparations. And Sweden and Kenya are the co-presidents of the conference. So in this opening session, we are fortunate to be able to hear from representatives from the EMG, from UNEP and from Sweden. And we're going to start with our good friend and colleague, uh, Hussein Fadeh, who I'm sure is known to all of you. He's there, he is Secretary and he will take the floor now, Hussein. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to colleagues, friends uh, from all around the world. Uh, thank you very much for your participation to this dialogue. Thank you, John, for accepting and honoring us uh, uh, by co-chairing, by, by chairing this uh, and um, moderating this um, dialogue, this important dialogue. Um, I will not be taking a lot of time. We have a um, distinguished number of uh, colleagues, speakers, discussants with us uh, today in this dialogue. I'm very uh, proud that they have, and privileged and uh, respectful for, uh, to all of them, that uh, they have accepted our invitation to be speaking today in this panel. Uh, these colleagues that have accepted to be in the panel are uh, the veterans, I would call them, uh, of the international environmental governance. Uh, and uh, all of them have really been in this journey in the last 50 years. And uh, we are really honored to have them with us uh, and um, privileged to be listening to them, uh, to their takeaways from the last 50 years, uh, their experiences, and also um, their perspectives uh, uh, for the future. So I will just uh, limit myself to say that the senior officials of the Environment Management Group uh, uh, have, ex have decided uh, in their uh, October meeting, in, uh, uh, which was held actually virtually this year, uh, to actually prepare a system-wide contribution uh, to the international uh, meeting of Stockholm Plus 50. 50. Uh, um, as a stakeholder uh, contribution, and uh, in doing so, the EMG Secretariat uh, uh, will organize a two-day um, dialogue. Uh, and perspectives from the UN system. Together with these dialogues, we will be also undertaking some heads of agencies interviews, as well as some um, kind of survey of existing materials which in the end will help us to prepare a synthesis and to provide a report as i said to the uh, to the meeting next year in june uh, we have thought uh, that uh, these uh, two dialogues uh, would really be useful for all of us uh, by being very open very 
frank and interactive by including all set of actors, government, uh, UN uh, colleagues, as well as uh, civil society, the future generation, uh, the young generation as well. Uh, and we have really tried to include into the panels um, a mix of all these um, contributors. And I really invite all of us to be very open, to be very frank in the way we discuss matters. This is not a negotiation uh, meeting here today and on the third year. It's really a forum, an open uh, forum for all of us to uh, exchange our thoughts and ideas for a better future. I will stop here, John. Uh, I would be happy to interact during the call at uh, any time. And I look forward to a very fruitful and open, transparent uh, discussion with your uh, able uh, chair. Over to you. Great, wonderful, Hussein. I echo those thoughts in terms of what we hope to get out of today. Just as an aside, Hussein's actually sitting right next to me to my left, even though he's on a separate screen. And I have a small screen in front of me and a big one on top of me. So if my eyes are darting all over the place, that's the reason why. Now, the um, UNEP Secretariat effort for Stockholm Plus 50 is being led out of its New York office. And Haruko Kusu was recently recruited from the CITES Secretariat right here in International Environmental House to support this preparatory effort as Principal Coordination Officer. And I'm delighted that Haruko is joining us today and she can tell us a little bit more about her role because I'm sure you're going to see and hear a lot more of her over the coming weeks and months. Haruko, over to you. Thank you, John. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Hossein and his, his team in the EMG Secretariat for organizing this two-part Nexus Dialogue event. Um, I've been appointed about a month ago as the Principal Coordination Officer for Stockholm Plus 50, and I'll be supporting uh, Lija Noronha, who is the head of the New York office as the Assistant Secretary General in her role as the direct responsible in individual for the organization of Stockholm Plus 50, the international meeting. So um, first of all, I'd like to also send my apologies uh, on behalf of Ligia, who was unable to attend uh, the Nexus Dialogue uh, due to schedule conflicts. So I will be uh, presiding on her behalf as well. Um, as you already know, Stockholm Plus 50 has a theme called a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, or responsibility, or opportunity. And this will be taking place on the 2nd and 3rd of June next year. Um, Stockholm Plus 50 is obviously a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Conference on Human and Environment, which took place in Stockholm in 1972, as well as a declaration uh, that was made as the outcome, which we all know as the Stockholm Declaration. It'll be a commemoration for us to do celebrate the Stockholm Plus 50, but it's also not just a time for reflection, but it's critically a time to think about the opportunities for urgent actions to anchor and harness the emerging opportunities for a better future on a healthy planet as part of our responsibility for future generations and to address the triple planetary crisis that we are facing at the moment. Uh, you might also know that Stockholm Plus 50 is not a forum for negotiation but it acts as a catalyst for actions towards a healthy planet and prosperity for all. Its success will be measured by collective actions, partnerships, social uh, protection systems, new social contracts and compacts with nature that might follow as a result of ideas and dialogues initiatives that were tabled at Stockholm, especially with a strong focus on including and empowering the youth and vulnerable groups. Also for UNEP, the priority lies on making partnerships with other UN agencies to enhance interconnectivity of country solutions to global challenges and strengthening an inclusive and networked environmental multilateralism. In this context, the Nexus Dialogue is coming at a very good timely moment, and it also complements the recent Stockholm Plus 49 event. The EMG brings together the voice of the UN and specialized agencies into a consolidated input into the discussions that will take place at Stockholm 50. On that note, I would like to thank also the discussants and the panelists who have gathered for this dialogue event and very much look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. 
Great. Thank you very much for that, Haruko. And um, we're now going to move to our third and final uh, statement, so our third and final statement for this opening. And uh, we're going to turn to someone who I'm sure is very well known uh, to all of you, Ambassador Johanna lissinger Pipe, And she's the Swedish ambassador for Stockholm Plus 50. And uh, she's with us today to offer some remarks on the road to Stockholm in June 22, 2022, which we're all very much looking forward to. Uh, Johanna, over to you. Thank you very much, John, and good to see you and good to see a lot of, of uh, old friends, I think, lined up for this session and, and hopefully also a lot of new friends uh, after these two hours. Um, so I thought what I would do is I know that you will have two sessions, one which is backward looking as of today and one which is forward looking. Uh, I think I will kind of, you know, take that encouragement of Hussein when he said, let's let's have an open and frank discussion and uh, not following the forward looking path, but actually provide more of the vision as we see for Stockholm Plus 50, focusing on some of the opportunities. And then hopefully throughout the panels and the discussions of the two sessions, you could use that to think about what in our backward experience are key things that we want to draw upon and how do we use them to do things even better uh, in the future. Um, and if I would, if I would have, I don't know how long time I have, but if I would have only one minute, um, the very, very short, I think, pitch for Stockholm Plus 50 is um, it's talking about, you know, where do we want to go? We know where we want to go. Uh, to use a phrase I think familiar with many, it's about making peace with nature. I think that somehow puts climate, biodiversity, equity issues, social issues very much together. So that's where we want to go. That's also where we want Stockholm to contribute to. And then how do we want to contribute to that? It's through focusing on nexus issues, interlinkages, interlinkages in looking at different environment um, areas, biodiversity, climate, what is the nexus look like, but also looking beyond the environment dimension and say, what are the other uh, issues that we also need to advance in an integrated way if we are to accelerate our implementation on environment and climate. Uh, and the other thing is really looking at where do we want to make a difference? You don't take an initiative of hosting a commemoration if you don't think that you can make a difference. And in what areas do we want to make a difference? And that, of course, is something that we could talk about a very long time. I would maybe make it quite simple for me and say there are three different levels. One is how do we work as the UN? How do we work in a multi-stakeholder, uh, multilateral context and building on what we have done so far, but work even better in a future, more networked multilateralists. So that's one area where we would might like to make a difference. Um, the other one is we want to contribute uh, to the system change. We have, uh, as everyone on this, um, I think Zoom call knows, uh, a very well established structure of conventions, agreement that meets through the COPs uh, and advance the agenda if it's biodiversity or if it's climate or if it's chemicals or if it's waste. Um, and of course, we have UNIA where many of these things comes together. But I think we see an opportunity in using a one-off meeting of Stockholm uh, in looking at the wider perspective and where do these issues meet especially with a focus on implementation, because if we are moving to implementation, it's about solutions and solutions are not provided in silos. So I think these are, are basically uh, where we want to go, where we want to contribute and, and uh, where do we want to make a difference. Uh, Haruko, in an essence, already spoke about much of the, you know, the formal mandate for Stockholm Plus 50. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we do see it very much as an accelerator of action for a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. I do think there are two key words that you have also used in the headline, I think, of this session of our responsibility. We have the responsibility to make sure that uh, the ecological footprints we leave behind is not hampering for future and current generations to develop well-being for them. Uh, but it's also very much focusing on the opportunity. And I think when we are, for using the Secretary General's world, when we are in a code red for 
humanity, it's easy to focus on, you know, what did we do wrong? You know, where have we failed? But I think we would really like with Stockholm Plus 50 to put a focus on the opportunity pathway. Uh, we are in a context where we have um, a transition that is underway. We know that it's not accelerating with enough speed. So what is it that we need to do better and faster? Uh, and I think actually the, the Fijian Climate Corp presidency had an excellent three wording in uh, moving faster, farther together. And, and that's really, I think, also what we like to see in, in Stockholm. Um, I think, Haruko, I think you spoke about the, the leadership dialogues, um, which we very much see being at the heart of Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, and uh, the first one on uh, reflecting on the urgency of action for a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. To us, there are two key words in that sentence. It's the urgency, uh, but it's also the reflecting part in allowing us for a one-off meeting at Stockholm to take a back step back and say, how do we actually create the system change? What are the building blocks that needs to change, not just to change the word and initiative by initiative or convention by convention, but how do we actually change the bigger system, which is not something that will happen overnight, but that is, I think, incredibly important for the longer run. And I think where this group, with all of the competence from different parts of, of the UN, can play an extremely important role. Um, so it's really about that systematic change for renewed relationship to nature, people, planet, prosperity. Second dialogue on sustainable and inclusive recovery. So actions for recovery, actions for build back better, uh, actions to prevent future pandemics and to rebalance development and address inequalities. Uh, and the third one, uh, accelerating implementation of the environment dimension of sustainable development, where I think if I would say a few keywords, accountability, accessibility um, and incentives to deliver on the commitments that we have made and we may be governments, but we may also be the business community. How do we fulfill and deliver on what we have promised and how can we show the accountability to that? Um, so that's basically somehow the overarching vision and thought. And um, I think also using Stockholm, and I would really encourage you in your discussions here and, and thinking about how do we act beyond the silos of individual challenge to a more systematic approach? Um, how do we build on existing initiatives? Because um, I think anyone who had anything to do with, with, with the last couple of weeks in Glasgow have seen that huge um, engagement from everyone to come with new commitments. How do we build on those, making sure that they cover a significant number of countries or of sectors or of business? Um, and how do we take them one step further? So how do we make sure that what is not, you know, for many uh, a pathway to net zero? How do we include nature positive? How do we include resource efficiency in those? Um, so it's it's for us, I think, um, a moment of, and Haruko said the same, it's a moment of commemoration. It's a moment of serious self-reflection. And to combine those two, to be able to make bold decisions for accelerated actions for a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. Uh, I think I stopped there. I think I used my time um, or uh, then happy to listen to, to the rest of the conversations, which I very much look forward to with an extremely, I think, knowledgeable panel and participants. Thank you, John. Wonderful. Thank you, Johanna. And that was an excellent overview of um, certainly what your expectations are, which reflect what the, the UN General Assembly has, has laid out. And I think you, you made reference to the three areas where you think, uh, you know, we can make a difference. And we have a fantastic array of panelists and discussants today who will pick up on all those issues you've referred to. So thanks to you. Thanks to Hussein and Haruko for, for setting the scene so well. And we're now going to move on to the, the dialogue part of, uh, of today's discussion. And as Hussein mentioned, uh, we have two sessions planned, uh, one today and the other uh, this time next week. For today, generally speaking, we're looking back. We're looking at successes, challenges, and lessons learned. And so this session is titled Taking Stock of Our Responsibility and Opportunity. Uh, responsibility and Opportunity, you just highlighted, Johanna. 
And then next week, our second session is a little more focused on looking forward. What can we do more of, less of, or do differently? What urgent action should we take? And how can we enhance cooperation and coherence? And that session is going to be titled Foreseeing the Future of Our Responsibility and Opportunity. Now, today, we are extremely fortunate to have five speakers and five discussants. And they've been asked to give us the benefit of their vast experience in working either with or within the UN system on what they consider to be the UN's successes, challenges and lessons learned since 1972 in advancing the environmental agenda and implementing the environmental dimension of sustainable development. And each of our panelists are being invited to speak for five minutes and in that time to offer their personal reflections and perspectives. And as Hussein said, we're not trying to negotiate anything here or build a consensus on these issues. Rather, we want to hear from and learn from each of the panelists and discussants' experience and to draw from their wisdom as the EMG prepares its inputs into the preparatory process. Now, I should say that we haven't scripted any of the speakers and they are free to focus on any issue that they find most compelling. And all of us sitting in here, myself included, we we'll hear what they have to say at the same time today, uh, which we're all looking forward to. Now, just pause here and say there's a little bit of noise in the background because they're actually doing a fire drill here in the International Environmental House. But Hussein and I have been given an exemption. So we're allowed to stay. Everyone else just had to go. Um, but there may be a little bit of noise in the background for a few moments. Now, each of our panelists are going to be followed by a discussant who's invited to offer their observations on the presentation as well as to share their own personal experiences and perspectives on the successes, challenges, and lessons learned. Now, all of our panelists and discussants have vast experience in their respective fields and highly impressive CVs. However, in the interest of time, they've all kindly agreed that we do not need to read their CV when introducing them. And rather, I will give a general introduction and uh, introduce them by their current title. And they will share details of their experience working with or within the UN as it pertains to their particular presentation. And I'm really grateful to all the panelists and discussants uh, for agreeing to that. Now, with that, uh, we're going to move to our speakers. But uh, just a quick reminder that um, you can post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you can express your support for a question if you like the look of it. And um, Nina there in New York is going to be moderating that for us and feeding through those questions to us in due course. Now we get to move to our first speaker and I'm delighted uh, to introduce Kirsten Stendhal. Uh, Kirsten has uh, long experience uh, in Finland with the Ministry of Environment. That's in fact where I first met her, uh, working very hard on all things to do with international environmental governance and synergies between conventions. And she then made the move into the, the UN, the UN Environment Program. And she's held many different roles over many years. Uh, with the UN Environment Programme, and her current title is Head of Ecosystems Integration Branch with UNEP. With that, Kirsten, over to you. Thanks a lot, John, and, and thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to this, uh, this really fascinating, really good, good event. And of course, I, I recognise Hossein and, and Yannicka working, working hard for, for this to, to come to fruition. And of course, also really happy to see both Haruko and especially Johanna, which who I uh, haven't seen for a while and have worked very, very closely with in the past. I can see that we are in terribly good hands. So thank you very much. I, I think this is, a, this is a wonderful opportunity, of course, to reflect on what one has done and, and what that means for, you know, uh, you know and, ref and, and taking the time to reflect on what, what, we, what this entails. What, ha what, have, what have I learned? Uh, what has, how has the system changed through my action? Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to very quickly give, an, uh, give a quick overview of how I came to where I am now. So worked for the government. And as you said, John, I, I have worked a lot on strengthening UNEP 
uh, in, in different processes. I have worked on bringing together Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm as one to deliver in a more stronger fashion. I have uh, been negotiating for Finland in Rio Plus 20 and uh, then worked uh, in the IPCC and now in my current position in, in Nairobi. Uh, all of these are actually uh, have been um, have been places where that have been offices that have been co-hosted so it's not only been unit it's it's actually been uh, an, uh in in most cases another un entity so for Basel, rotterdam and stockholm it was the rotterdam convention which was co-hosted by fao and unep in ipcc it was wmo and unep co-hosting the secretariat taking the work forward and now in my current uh, position, I work very closely with UNDP on poverty environment action for sustainable development goals. So I've, I've, I've worked on um, on collaborative efforts and but I do recognize at the same time that uh, uh, Johanna you were talking about silos of course we have silos it, it's uh, 2015 it's since 2015 we have set in place the SDGs, the system-wide approach, which I find absolutely key. I, I think uh, I think Stockholm plus 50, UNEP and its, its efforts uh, really came to fruition uh, during Rio plus 20. I think it was a great game changer. I also think it was um, it was an accolade to UNEP and, it, at it, and its work that the environmental dimension of the sustainable development goals uh, came to be as strong as it is. And, and, but in so doing, we also recognized that we have to work with the social and the economic dimension. And this brings us to this person in the middle of the icon of that of the logo of UNEP, and I think there we still have some work to do. And I find, uh, especially now, working on poverty eradication and climate change and environment, that this, of course, won't happen unless we can guarantee livelihoods for the poorest, for the most vulnerable. And that icon in the middle of the logo of UNEP also talks to the different um, to the different shapes and forms that we come to this table uh, to for the betterment of the environment. And and I think here as well, I, I think it is only now that we are learning that issues such as gender, that issues such as race. Uh, play a huge role and I would say we are we we have started on the road uh, towards recognizing that gender and race plays a huge role in whatever tools and means we put together to implement what we have agreed on but I don't think we recognize how much more work we need to do for that. Because I think when we talk about the silos and the fragmentation, it's it's the it's you know it's the work culture within UNEP, but it is also understanding the people on the ground. And 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 there, you know, in in a way, and I, I thought about it a lot when I was working for the IPCC. We know what the problem is. Uh, through our MEAs, we know what the problem is. We have set the uh, the goals to make the situation better. But the question that everyone seems to be asking, and this happened all the time during IPCC press uh, and media events, was, yeah, but what now? How do how do we do it? What are the tools? And I think that's where we still need so much uh, you know that I, I think it suffices I, I think we need to get the plastics convention but otherwise I, I think we are in a very good position when it's when it comes to 
what it is that needs to be done. It's really the how now. And, and the advisory role that UNEP has and, and moving away. And I, I liked your, um, uh, your uh, you know, uh, depiction, uh, Johanna, about initiative by initiative. And I would say even pilot by pilot. I think we need to scale up so much more. It's, it's, and I, I like the fact that, for example, when we do poverty environment action uh, projects now in, in Africa and Asia, we embed people in the governments, in the finance, uh, you know, sector uh, to advise on how to do, you know, uh, climate neutral budgets. We, we put them in there and we, you know, it's, it's not necessary that we travel from Nairobi to, to uh, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, officials, but we have someone that can work with the government and, and, and really advise them surplus. And I think that's going to be a huge difference. So I think, I guess it is now to walk the talk. And with this, I will, uh, I, I think I've reached my final point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. There was a, a lot in there. Um, and certainly, I think we're all happy the environmental dimension of sustainable development has been strengthened. I think, again, the impression that perhaps the institution that uh, is leading on that perhaps hasn't been strengthened quite as much uh, to follow through on that uh, is part of what I take advantage, along with the, the issue of implementation uh, being key. So thank you very much for that. Uh, stay with us. We're now going to move to the first discussant, and we're going to move to Stephen Stone. And Stephen Stone had a a long history with various banks, uh, the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, before joining UNEP in uh, 2010. I think that's when we first met. And um, he is currently the Deputy Director of the Economy Division with UNEP. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, John. Great to see you again in the Environment House, live and direct. Um, and Kirsten, it was also great hearing from you. You know, I heard you say, it is really how we get it done now, not so much the what, and also that it's time to walk the talk. That, of course, goes at all levels. Um, what comes immediately to mind, of course, is the Sustainable UN Initiative. Our friend Isabella Maris, who is leading the work to get the UN to actually um, do what it also advocates doing. So, hmm, 50 years back, John, I was eight years old in 1972. <laughs> I was a youngster, you know, and I was thinking how um, how did was such a pivotal moment so many lives because for me it was the time the environment showed up as something material to all of us, and certainly within the UN, it was the first time it showed up on our collective awareness. So success, recognizing the centrality of the environment for human well-being, it was perhaps the first time. Uh, the second success that I reflect on is coming together. You know, the ability of the UN to convene and bring all of these different people together, um, including heads of state from, from India and other places, uh, was, was a turning point, I think, in 72, and recognizing that the challenges are bigger than any one single country, they're bigger than any one single person. And then the third, um, the third reflection I had you know, Stockholm in 1972, and then sort of beyond, it created a new normal. So I'm, I'm thinking back to, you know, slavery in the 19th century, right? It was outlawed. It was no, it was normal. It was no longer normal. Uh, tobacco, same thing. And in our day and age, coal, you know, burning coal, look at the phase, the phase down and the phase out conversation. So to me, those are part of the successes that we bring forward from 1972 to where we are today, coming into 2022. And as the UN, I think we can reflect on a lot of successes, uh, mercury, um, ozone, the many, many different successes that member states and the UN that serves the member states have delivered on. Challenges, that was the second question you asked me to think about. We have so many challenges. When I think about the major challenge for all of us, I think it's inertia. It is inertia, John, because there's so much moving in one direction. Our economies are locked into hardwired investments, fixed investments that have 30 year life cycles. Um, every year, you know, 20 to 30% of GDP is reinvested for another 30 years. So there's just massive amounts of inertia. 
And we really need to recognize that in order to project ourselves into the future, the next 50 years, that conversation you'll be having next week, those decisions are happening today. Those investment decisions are happening today. So we really need to bring them front and center. Uh, second major challenge I see is, you know, we're having sort of the, <laughs> it's, a back, it's a backlash against globalization. Globalization did not work for all. There were so many people who were left behind in that consumer surplus led push to trade liberalization, to deregulation that essentially left so many people behind. And we're seeing the, the pushback on that now with this sort of me first nationalism. This is a huge challenge for the UN because if there isn't networked multilateralism, we can't work on common solutions together. Um, and the third challenge that I see, and uh, Kirsten must mention this as well, as well, is the persistent inequalities, which have really only gotten worse uh, over the past 10 to 20 years. So the last bit I wanted to talk about, John, was the, the lessons, um, some of the lessons from Stockholm 72, and what we can bring forward in our bags as we travel forward towards uh, Stockholm plus 50 and forward. So the first is clearly redefining self-interest. We are stronger together. We need to rethink self-interest on a, on a fragile planet. There's a wonderful book by Ed Barbier. He's called The Economics for a Fragile Planet. Um, second point, key lesson, rebalancing, rebalancing. Fairness is essential. And without fairness, we cannot move. We cannot move together. And the third and the last one is reinventing and renewing the social contract. Because at the very root, our governance structure, whether it's multilateral, national, community, whatever level, uh, we need to re-examine and renew that social contract. And I see Stockholm Plus 50 as a very interesting space because it is not a negotiating space. It's a space where a thousand flowers can bloom. We can have voices from all over the world. We can listen to youth. We can listen to businesses. What do they need to flourish in the 21st century? So with that, John, back to you. It's a great time to think blue sky. And uh, it's great to have you facilitating this conversation. Back over to you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, thanks for so succinctly capturing all of those elements. Uh, I can't summarize it because you summarized it so well in yourself. And, you know, you were eight years old in 1972. I was about the same age. And believe it or not, I was actually in Stockholm in June 1972. But I was there visiting my Swedish grandparents. I didn't know there was a conference going on at the time. But there is someone with us today who, in fact, was in Stockholm in June 1972, who, in fact, was attending the conference. So we're very lucky today to have with us Jan Gustav Strandenes. And he's going to hear his insights from who was actually there in person. And I'm sure he felt the same sort of things you did as an eight-year-old, Stephen, but perhaps with a slightly older head on his shoulders. And uh, he's going to share with us his insights as someone who's not necessarily been in the UN, but working with the UN for some considerable time. And Jan is Senior Advisor on Governance and Sustainability for Pure and Stakeholder Forum. Over to you, Jan Gustav. Thank you very much, um, uh, John, for this very kind introduction. And yes, that's true, I was there. I wasn't eight years old. Um, I was a bit older. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. And uh, let me thank the organizer for having invited me to this very special and important EMG meeting. I'm a Norwegian national. I was in Stockholm and I was working then as an intern for the Morris Strong team. And I have stayed with environmental issues uh, ever since. And next year, 50 years will have elapsed since the environment was firmly placed on the global agenda. 50 years ago, the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment ended in what may be termed political euphoria. Those of us who were there felt we had accomplished something incredibly important and the world would, would be progressing towards a better future. Today, 50 years later, the world with its environment is in greater peril than ever, than it has ever been in the history of humanity. Propagated by short-term interests and motivated by material wealth, decision makers in politics and the private sector, consistently ignoring easy to understand warnings from scientists, have driven the world forward in unsustainable ways and paid only lip service to the need for dramatically changing direction. This egregious disregard for these warnings have led to a global pandemic of dimensions that almost exceed our fantasies. In addition, 
a continuing and steady current of well-respected and well-researched re reports identify and address environment problems that are not being solved. Many a pessimist predicts, predicts a disastrous future if we cannot turn the negative trend. Commemorating a global disaster seems out of place, but no time seems more appropriate to turn the a paralyzing pessimism into a positive action just than now. No time and place seem more opportune to do so than next year in Stockholm. 50 years ago, participants at the Stockholm conference had every reason to feel optimistic. And today, 50 years later, our global work for the environment can showcase many successes. The conference in 1972 agreed to establish a global organization to deal exclusively with the environment and UNEP was born. It was a global institutional home for the environmental law and environmental rights, and it had been created then. We saw the beginning of good environmental governance when the 1972 Stockholm Conference allowed civil society and NGOs to address at first the official plenary on a regular basis, establishing a precedence that challenged all subsequent UN conferences forever, allowing greater participation from non-state stakeholders not only in UN meetings, but in intergovernmental meetings all over. An important contribution to global democracy had been made. An institution to connect science with the environment had been created, which also could develop environmental policies. We also saw the development of environmental assessment and management as a result. An environmental diplomacy began. 50 years ago, there was little awareness of environmental issues. Today, millions in all countries know about and are concerned about the global environment, not the least thanks to the work of UNEP. The conference 50 years ago changed the direction of politics and development in many ways. It began research that led to growing understanding and decision on climate issues, on the ozone issues, on the plight of the ocean, intensified research and understanding of biodiversity, focused on the danger of chemicals, globalized ideas and understanding of ecosystems and biodiversity, and pushed forward environmental lawmaking. Making sure all this is continued with increased resources is a must and should be one of the commitments made next year, both at UNEP at 50, but more so also in Stockholm. The title of the Stockholm conference next year invites all to be carefully optimistic, but also points to a seriousness we face a common responsibility to reorganize ourselves. In many ways, we do not need new plans. We have a key one waiting to be implemented, the 2030 Agenda to transform our world into a world based solely on sustainable development. We can use the conference in Stockholm to focus on solutions and implementation of all these plans. We can make Stockholm Plus 50 into an environment and sustainable development festival to celebrate progress, solve challenges, and act positively. The Stockholm Conference will discuss issues relating to how to proceed forward in a greener, more sustainable way. It's a golden opportunity to plan and reset society on all accounts after the devastating pandemic. But we must also remember that the environment is more than just the climate. Countries should commit to increasing the financial support to a new UNEP, a UN specialized agency for the environment and to identify new issues that are already on the agenda, but have not yet been integrated into policies, such as ecocide, strengthen environmental law with real binding commitments, protect environmental defenders, safeguarding the participation of civil society, which is being threatened every day. Next year, we can organize a game-changing conference and boost implementation going forward greener and better with rights for all. We've come far but not far enough. As a historian, I will state that we've come a long way in a short period of time. But as an environmentalist, I will emphatically state that we've not come far enough. We can progress, but only if we have the courage, political will, and the resources and mutual trust to create a healthy planet for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Gustav. Well said, I can see some participants giving you a round of applause there. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a lot in there, and certainly we could have a long discussion about uh, UN specialised agencies, but I think what I more picked up from what you said was the whole issue of blending enthusiasm and hope with realism about where we are and the, the challenges we have. Uh, so a nice blend there, and the push of policy, law and diplomacy, but also the push on science. And for our discussant, we're going to move to someone 
who's been working uh, very much on science, including uh, with the IPBS. And we have uh, Eduardo um, Bondizio, who's a distinguished professor of anthropology and adjunct professor at the Department of Geography and School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, Bloomington, uh, nominated by UNESCO. Uh, Eduardo, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, really honored with the invitation. Uh, just to add to my background a little bit, I've been working in the Amazon uh, for over 30 years, continue to have very on the ground program there. And as John said, I, I served as co-chair of the Global Assessment Report for IPBES, released in 2019. Um, Jan Gustav did a fantastic job. He basically covered all the points that I have. So I'm talking a little bit more spontaneously here. And I organized just a little bit different of the wonderful coverage that he did, which is looking back in terms of contributions. You know, I think about three areas that, that uh, uh, you know, we wouldn't be here where we are today without uh, where we started there, which is science of uh, the Earth system. You know, so there's uh, the whole process of, of beginning uh, to understand the, the Earth as a system. And that was, was you know, sort of uh, took off after that. My impression in looking at that history is that uh, actually look at many other aspects is that the ambitions was much bigger than what actually developed in the sense that when I look at the beginning of the Earth system science area, it was much more a physical science, social science, ecological science enterprise. And then it evolved more along the lines of the natural science, the social science and, and so forth to more recently come back together you know, in a more integrated way. But nonetheless, uh, of course, as, as Ian Gustav said, you know, a, a very important advance is in how we understand, how we assess, you know, the, the knowledge about, about the planet. The second one also well covered is the governance and environmental diplomacy. You know, uh, one exercise that I do with my students in class, uh, remember that most of the students that we have today have no idea about what, what the Montreal Protocol is, for instance. So we do an exercise of you know, thinking, what would the world look like today without the Montreal Protocol? And get them to step back, to understand and to appreciate you know, how much progress have done on many fronts when they are in face of you know, a world in which everything is a crisis. So you know, to build that hope and to build that understanding that much progress has been made that is affecting directly how they live today, although in ways that are invisible. And of course, mainstreaming, you know, in the, in the public, in the economy, uh, as Jan Gustav, I think, said it wonderfully, I think the conference market, you know, a major change in environmentalism from a, a philanthropic, you know, sort of nature out there environmentalism to a human center environmentalism. So three areas, I think, where, you know, uh, there's a lot to, to, to look back and to celebrate. Now, I'm going to be a little provocative for this, the, the, this, the sense of the exercise on areas that we haven't made progress. Uh, and I'll start with a provocation. I think the Stockholm worked great for the Global North. And when we look back 50 years and we look at indicators in, in the economy, in GDP, and you know, environmental quality, and uh, you know, how resources are used, the pattern uh, that we see from 50 years ago to today, hardly change it, right? Um, in the way the sort of frontier of resource extraction and, and natural resource uh, you know, use has been moving around the world. And it hasn't changed it very much. And I'll say you know, two reasons or three reasons, I think that um, you know, we haven't uh, as much uh, uh, addressed or, or confronted. The first one I think is, uh, you know, the, the environmental agenda evolved very much in parallel to the trade agenda. And only recently, those two agendas are coming together. And here we have a process in which, you know, we're talking about globalization, is a process marked by flexible accumulation. So we create a whole framework of, you know, frontiers of resource use and pollution and appropriation of labor that continues to move around the world. Uh, and we haven't tackled enough uh, and brought the trade agenda you know, uh, in line with, um, 
the environmental agenda. So that, that's an area that evolved uh, basically in parallel. The second point, or perhaps the most important point, and the, the reason behind, I think, still some of the problems, in my opinion, is that our mental models of development has hardly changed. We haven't contested this very linear model that we have of moving from least developed to developing to the you know developed countries, which is, is similar to very 19th century uh, social evolutionary models, right? And that is predicated on the idea that you build upon using your natural resources, creating surplus, exporting, you know, doing uh, uh, demographic changes and technological changes to get to a particular point. And that's a model that we haven't contested, we haven't, uh, you know, sort of, of um, critically assess, you know, what does it represent and how does it support a model of development that continues to track the least developed and developing countries in a pathway that, you know, it's, it's sort of leading to where we are. So I think fundamentally we haven't, we haven't articulated a different uh, way of thinking about different models of development that accommodate people's need, you know, within the boundaries that we need to work with. And my third point is that uh, I think, you know, looking back in the early 1970s, perhaps, you know, with the influence when you think about you know, in this part of the world, you know, the civil rights movement and, and other movements that were bringing uh, uh, social issues to the fore. I see the social justice agenda also, you know, stay on the side until very recently. And, you know, in part because of, of the way I think we see uh, uh, environment and social justice as part of, of, of the development models that, that, we, uh, that we pursue. I'll, I'll stop here. Um, uh, of course, could go on each one of those areas, but just to kind of throw off some ideas and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Eduardo. And thanks for starting on the science and talking about the need to convergence amongst science as much as we need amongst other forms of governance and law and policy, but also highlighting the trade agenda development model and social justice issues, which certainly seem to be coming to the fore uh, quite recently. Um, we're going to uh, move to a colleague, uh, Eva Buster, who um, I'm sure is very well known to you. If you wanna talk about science in the UN, there's probably nobody better placed He's been at the center of this for as long as I can remember. And um, I, I, I have to say, and I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but this computer was a bit low and I had to get a copy of Geo6 to prop it up a little bit. But it's used for many more purposes other than propping up my computer. It's not my computer, actually. So, uh, but Ivar has been, um, he and I met uh, in Nairobi, but he's been at the center of all things to do with science, both within UNEP, with the uh, IPCC, IPBS, um, with the Geo, um, and he's uh, now out of the UN and, and back with the Norwegian government. He's currently co-chair for the future of the Geo Process Steering Committee and senior advisor at the Norwegian Environment Agency. Iva, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, John. And, and as, actually, also as a, as a former director of, of the EMG, it's really nice also to be to be here with you all. It's a bit like coming home. So, so dear colleagues, I'll, I'll try to make actually three points here. So the first one is really that our key challenge is that currently as humanity we are degrading and surpassing the earth's finite capacity to sustain human well-being uh, that was one of the key conclusions in a recent uh, synthesis of global assessments that i co-led uh, for unep um, eduardo was part of the process uh, it was entitled uh, making peace with nature um, and uh, prepared for the 50 years uh, anniversary of unep in stockholm so the problem is really a cause by a formidable human expansion over the past Past 50 years, the economy has grown by a factor of nearly five, population has doubled. Um, and as, as Eduardo pointed to, it really follows an increasingly unequal and resource intensive development model. So, uh, on inequality, 1.3 billion people poor, uh, more than 700 million uh, hungry on the rise after a period of reduction. We have in 50 years tripled the extraction of natural resources, food, and energy. We have a, a major impact on three quarters of land and two thirds ocean. So, there's really not 
any surprise that the environmental challenges have grown in number and severity ever since the Stockholm conference. We face, as we've heard, a, a triple climate biodiversity and pollution emergency, and it's impacting human well-being now, uh, such as in, in the area of food security. My other point is really that the environment agenda in the UN has evolved tremendously in response to these challenges, but not nearly enough to stem the tide. Um, and uh, I very much agree that it's really important to look at what has worked and what has failed. Uh, and among uh, the main issues uh, and successes, I think, of the UN system, maybe not surprisingly coming from one who's been working a lot on, on, on science, is actually the, the scientific assessments. Um, I think they really have helped us identify and track the challenges. Uh, their intergovernmental nature also help, has helped sort of make sure that um, knowledge is jointly owned by member states. That has served as a, a foundation um, for basically setting out the uh, ambitions in the multilateral environmental agreements. Um, and, and these ambitions really uh, serves uh, in many ways as a sort of boundaries for human impacts on the environment. It's set out in targets, it's informed by science. And I think the prime example, and we've heard it already today, is really this uh, of success is really uh, when um, uh, science through assessments was turned into ambitions that has yielded action, uh, which ensures that we are now on course to restore the stratospheric ozone layer, but not until 2065 or so. So the science was clear, alternatives were found, uh, the number of actors relatively limited. But except for that, um, efforts to meet other targets have largely failed be it climate, biodiversity, and many parts of the pollution uh, emergency. And we know why. Uh, it's really because, um, and science and assessments have been telling us that uh, the challenge is, is really systemic. We need uh, to transform societies and economies, uh, such as uh, by targeting and, and meeting the indivisible and mutually supportive sustainable development goals. My third point is really that um, it's, it's, a, it's an optimistic one. It's really, um, yeah, and it's a key message also from the report making piece uh, with nature uh, that was launched by the Secretary General. It, human knowledge, ingenuity, technology and cooperation can transform societies and economies for sustainable future. And I think the UN and the EMG in particular is, is uniquely placed to facilitate it. So um, the Secretary General in, in, in his forward to the report uh, basically uh, called on the world to end the senseless and suicidal war on nature, strong words. Uh, and I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is really a wake up call to all of us. So we must now sort of restore uh, respect and adapt to the Earth's capacity to sustain human well-being. And that really entails a shift from transforming nature to transforming humankind's relationship with nature. And as others have talked about, transformation would really involve a fundamental change in technological, uh, economic, social, organizational society, including worldviews, norms and values, uh, governance is the issues that, that Eduardo also pointed to. Um, it can be done, uh, we think, without surrendering uh, hard-won development gains, also honoring rightful aspirations of poor nations and people to enjoy better living standards. And I think actually the UN and EMG is really uniquely placed um, to address it because it is comprised uh, of all the entities which respect, uh, represents the interests and, and knowledge in virtually all sectors. So uh, a key point in the report is, is obviously that uh, the economic and financial uh, systems need to lead and power the shift to sustainability. We sort of speak to all the different aspects that needs to be addressed. I don't want to go into it here, but again, I think EMG already through its work on the green economy report a decade ago or so, um, and it really shows how, how the UN actually can pool its resources. Obviously it's, there's a need to transform the food system, the energy system, production, consumption, infrastructure, settlements, promote a, a one health uh, approach with more than uh, clear than ever. Um, address all these issues through humanitarian affairs, peace building. Again, the UN is really uh, uniquely placed to sort of bring together all these different actors from governments, private sector, individuals, households, civil society, indigenous peoples, uh, and science. Um, so I think that what we really need to sort of now uh, take with us is that the burden of an environmental de decline, I think as you also pointed to it, really weighs uh, heaviest on the poor and vulnerable and loses even, even larger over today's and, 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 uh, and young and, and the future generations. And I think really Stockholm plus 50 can 
be a, a very important impetus for, for uh, renewed uh, action in, in this field. So with, with those uh, few uh, reflections, back to you, uh, John. Thank you very much, Ivan. A very important point. It's not about transforming nature, but rather transforming our relationship with nature. And thankfully, through your good work and many other colleagues, Eduardo and many others in line, we, we now have the science base. As you said, it drove um, the response to ozone. It's driving the response to biodiversity and climate and increasingly plastics. It's just that we're not living up to what the science tells us we need to do. But without the science, we'd be nowhere. Uh, we'd be flying blind. So uh, thanks to you and all, all the scientific community that uh, have put that all together. We're going to move to our next discussant. And um, our next discussant has a, a long uh, interrelationship with the UN, currently with the World Food Programme. It's Jan Schele. He's the Senior Environmental and Social Sustainability Advisor, Program Humanitarian and Development Division with the World Food Programme. So over to you, Jan. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, yeah, over the past few decades, I've worked in academia and, and with different UN agencies. And um, Ivar, you, you may be interested or pleased to hear that actually the framework for advancing the environmental and social sustainability of the UN system that you oversaw when you were secretary of the, of the EMG um, has now actually resulted into a strategy for the, to increase the environmental and social sustainability of the UN. And, and I, I, I also supported you, the EMG, on this. Um, but today, I would really like to represent the humanitarian branch of the UN because I think um, this perspective um, is, is pretty unique and is may, I may be the only one on this panel that would represent this perspective. Um, and, and I'd also like to connect uh, with or make the connection with the, the report you mentioned, Ivar, the, the, the Making Peace with Nature um, report. It, it clearly lays out the different interconnections between environmental degradation, the, 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 the triple crisis, environmental crisis, food insecurity, conflict. And so this brings me actually to, to the point I wanted to make to, to, to the, the main um, success of the humanitarian sector, I would say over the past few decades, I would say the last two, three decades, is really the recognition of multiple interlinkages between humanitarian crises and environmental degradation. Um, I mean, the, 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 the interconnect now they seem obvious, but 30 years ago, they were not as obvious. And environmental degradation increases people's vulnerability. 80% of food insecure people in the world today live in degraded environments. And so you can imagine that just an extra shock, such as a flood or a drought, can easily, easily push them over the brink of starvation or could even lead to, to conflict and, and, and migration. Um, but but this link between environmental degradation and humanitarian disaster also works the other way around. Um, conflict and displacement themselves also degrade natural resources. Just to give you an example, um, Syria lost approximately 20% of its tree cover during the 10 years of conflict, mainly because displaced people need wood as fuel. They don't have access to other types of fuel. So, um, for this reason, humanitarian organizations like the World Free Program, but also non-UN uh, aid humanitarian organizations are working together to increase the environmental sustainability of their humanitarian operations. We, we are already tracking and reducing our carbon emissions since more than 10 years. Um, we, we work together to improve waste management. We try to provide access to clean energy to, to people in, in disasters. In, or, or in need wherever we can. So I think the main achievement of the humanitarian sector is actually this realization that a dollar spent on the environmental sustainability of a humanitarian operation is no longer a dollar taken away from the mandate to save lives. So, but, and, and, and this also comes to the fore in this report, um, you, you, you mentioned uh, making peace with nature, but um, whilst, so while the, U, while the humanitarian organizations have come to recognize these many interlinkages, I think big challenges remain for, for, the, United, for, this, for, the, for the United Nations system in the coming decades for two reasons. Because conflict and violence are changing the face of, of the nature of um, conflict and violence have changed incredibly since Second World War. Um, they are increasingly domestic, increasingly protracted. So, and while, while maybe the absolute number of war that has reduced, still um, more people than ever are displaced. One person every 95 is displaced. 
This is the highest number of displaced people we've seen since World War II. And this is compounded by the triple environmental crisis of pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate change. Now, of all those displaced people, 90% of refugees and 70% of internally displaced people live in one of 20 countries that are categorized as the most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to climate change. So imagine what's coming in the, in the future. Imagine what's, what the world is going to look like when maybe um, we will live in a world of two degrees warmer with hundreds of millions of people more food insecure and these refugees and displaced people living in the most vulnerable countries least um, equipped to adapt to climate change. So I think the humanitarian system and the UN maybe as a system needs to carefully think if it's really equipped today uh, to meet these increasingly complex and protracted humanitarian needs mm -hmm. against this backdrop of the triple environmental crisis that is very likely to grow in scale and intensity. Um, so this is an ex an, a reflection that the UN needs to make and I think will make um, in the near future. But I think I would like to end this uh, intervention with a, with a message of hope. I think there, there are lessons we've learned and there are opportunities to address humanitarian needs ahead of shocks. So we have seen that this is possible. Governments and go humanitarian actors can take preventive actions ahead of climate shocks. They can reverse environmental degradation. They can increase the resilience of very vulnerable people. But this requires reliable and, and timely forecast information. This, this needs the support of, support of donors and, and financial instruments, innovative financial instruments that make such anticipatory action possible. This needs the collaboration of all stakeholders, including civil society, uh, governments, and UN system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. Thanks for, for offering that humanitarian perspective. I think Johanna, when she started, was talking about interlinkages within the environmental dimension, but interlinkages outside of that. And uh, you've highlighted with some very graphic statistics there, uh, the interlinkages going both ways. Um, and if we can't deal with that, then, um, then we're going to be up against it. And I think perhaps there's a common thread from all the speakers and discussants so far has been, we need to look both within and outside of the environment sector uh, in the way in which you have, have highlighted. And thanks for giving us a little glimmer of hope there uh, towards the end. Um, we'll now move to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, Johanna Bernstein. Um, Johanna just asked me to introduce her as an international environmental lawyer, but I'm going to add to that. Anyone that knows Johanna knows that in addition to that, she is a serious dog lover. And mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you can avoid talking about the dogs today because she's only got five minutes. But uh, she's an international environmental lawyer with uh, a great uh, track record, but she'll uh, elaborate upon that during the course of her intervention. Uh, Johanna, over to you. Thanks very much, Sean, and greetings to everybody. Um, I was actually 11 in 1972, but I was 31 in 1992, and I ran the Canadian Multi-Stakeholder Coalition at a time when we didn't even know what the word multi-stakeholder mean. We didn't know that it existed. So I've been working in that in this space for the last 30 years. It's been a great passion of mine and a great honor and indeed a great privilege. I'm going to answer the three questions through the lens of one issue. And it's an issue that I believe lies at the core of everything we've been talking about this afternoon. Indeed, it's an issue that has been the focus of my professional life, and that is the, the health and well being of the system of environmental multilateralism. And, you know, I think Stockholm Plus 50, um, timed with the SG's common agenda, is in answer to, to rephrase um, a point that John you used in 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 a previous statement or, or inter intervention, and that it is a watershed moment, right? Stockholm Fifty is a watershed moment for renewing the system of environmental multilateralism to ensure that it really is fit for purpose and fit for the Anthropocene and fit for the red code scenario that we are now facing. So the first question in terms of what have been the main successes. So I'm going to highlight a very specific success of Stockholm, and that is the framing of a new ethos, a new principle on global responsibility, global solidarity. And it's that principle which indeed made five decades of multilateral environmental lawmaking possible. And you see that language in the declaration, uh, in the preamble, in principles 24 and 25. But for me, 
the most powerful expression of the importance of environmental lateralism that would come to be the norm for the next 50 years came from the late Morris Strong, who like for so many, Morris was a mentor of mine. I worked with him for many years. And I reread last night his opening statement to um, Stockholm. And what was so interesting was how prescient it was. You know, we, many of us who knew Morris knew he was just a f formidable visionary. And I think that if he were alive today, if uh, his opening statement to Stockholm plus 50 would be very similar to the statement he made 50 years ago. And I, I just want to share a few um, key nuggets, if you will, from his opening statement that really give, um, you know, that they, they, they give a deeper um, uh, sort of understanding of Morris's vision for mod environmental multilateralism. And indeed, it's the challenge today that I want to address. So Morris was very clear that the declaration, the Stockholm Declaration, was less than inspirational, but that it represented an indispensable beginning. And that beginning was a principle that all that would hold all nations responsible for the consequences of their own actions outside their borders, principle 21. But principle 21 was the minimum basis for effective international co cooperation. And his vision for global cooperation was framed around statements like this, that our determination must be to enrich mankind gendered language and to advance together that our power, our demands, our numbers have made our interdependence an inescapable reality. And that we must forge a new vision of the larger, richer future, which our collective will and energies can shape. We have to act as the whole community of man. And we also, um, uh, Morris also said that the UN system carries a direct and a, and a very unique responsibility for building that vehicle for international cooperation that will enable that journey. So against that backdrop, I just want to make, um, you know, this is a backdrop against which I want to highlight the, the success, indeed, this, the principle of global cooperation that was ushered in by Stockholm 72. And it laid the groundwork for 50 years of lawmaking, as I said, but this system of in, environmental multilateralism, it, we can see as both a triumph and at the same time, a manifestation of just inherent weaknesses of a system that is no longer fit for purpose. So that brings me to the second question about the challenges. And again, like everyone said today, despite five decades of MEAs, we've seen great success, but we're now in the grips of a global planetary emergency. And I remember, um, was it Geo Ford that said that we've never seen so many, or, or um, Ivar will know exactly which one, we've never seen so many environmental goals and objectives, but ecosystem decline is increasing and now we're in a red alert state. So the question is, why, what is it about our system of multilateralism that seems to have um, become unfit for purpose? So uh, recently, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said multilateralism is under fire precisely at the time when we need it most. And so the irony is that the Anthropocene has revealed a fundamental contradiction. And that's on the one hand, a deep understanding of the Earth's own integrated natural systems, but a system which ironically is governed by a terribly fragmented international governance system that arbitrarily like the planet into over 190 um, mutually exclusive independent territories. So the question is, it, with a world that is organized this way, or more accurately disorganized, can possibly address the grave environmental challenges that pay no heed to national borders. And I think the real fault line in the system results from results in the primacy of national sovereignty over the common good. And I won't go into detail on that point, but I think we, um, we know that just as the nature of global challenges are changing, we've got to change or reconsider how we craft our multilateral approaches to these critical transnational challenges. Um, and as Gro Harlem Brundtland said, and again, I re read a recent article that she wrote um, uh, just a year ago, she said the challenge ahead is for us to transcend the self-interest of our respective nation states 
so as to embrace a broader self-interest. And indeed, if you, I, I did reread um, the Brunton Commission report where she talked about, believe it or not, for the first time, the whole concept of responsible sovereignty. And so it leads me to question three, notably, what are the lessons learned that we need to accelerate the renewal for environmental um, um, environmentalism, not in a, co in a post COVID world, but I, I hate to say in a COVID adjusted world. And so the key lessons is that number one, there's an incredible opportunity now for Stockholm Plus 50 to energize and, and feed into um, the SG's common agenda where he, as you know, is called for renewed multilateral cooperation. Um, lesson number one is that at the core of any renewal effort, we need a fundamental rethink of humanity's relationship with nature. And this, I know, point everybody, well, I think, Eva, you were the last one to say this. And I think that um, this fundamental rethink has to underpin that pathway towards system change. Um, we have to recognize the intrinsic value of nature, the unity, the interdependence of humans with nature, and, the, and I'd say the greater Earth community. And I think a new, this is a quote from um, Johan Rockström at our recent pavilion on the post-2020 partnership, is that we need a new paradigm for sustainable development, one that focuses on living within planetary boundaries, that protects our common um, global commons, that reconnects our economy to nature by valuing nature in all spheres of political and economic decision-making, and of course, operationalizing the universal right to a clean and safe and healthy environment. Lesson two, and I'll be very quick, is that efforts to renew multilateralism must be accompanied by serious reframing of national sovereignty. I won't go into more detail, but just simply to say that the state now has become an awkward and arbitrary reference point in a dynamic or system that needs a governance system fit for purpose. And while sovereignty remains a pillar, it, ha it, can't, it can no longer be treated as a static and movable fact but rather a flexible tool, one that is increasingly more responsive, that expand, that is expanded to incorporate our, our mutual responsibility, our stewardship, our, um, um, our commitment to the other than a human world, um, and perhaps a new norm of responsibility to protect earth. So lesson three, we need to cultivate a deeper sense of global solidarity. And, um, you know, what I've observed in the last 30 years of engaging in UN negotiations on environment and development is that many of the world's biggest challenges are not a result of disagreements about how to cooperate, but a profound loss of direction about why to cooperate. And this means catalyzing a new perception of multilateralism that can convince member states of the need for collective action that transcends narrow national interests. But this transformation towards deeper collective responsibility has to be grounded in a new eth ethic of solidarity, which at the same time respects the multitude of identities within the global human family. But the tension, the conflict and the uncertainty that comes from deep differences provides in many cases, the greatest potential for the creative emergence of new solutions. But that's only possible when all actors bring a new enlightened leadership to the negotiating table. So how, and these are my final words, can Stockholm Plus 50 contribute to the renewable, renewal, no pun intended, the renewal of environmental multilateralism? It needs to be the turning point for the transformative change that we need on every level and in every sphere to keep humanity and the planet in a safe operating space. It's, Stockholm Plus 50 is a once in a lifetime opportunity but, and this transformative change is really for our political leaders to find the servant leadership mindset deep within in order to stand together, to question the unquestionable, to challenge the status quo, to embrace new ideas and commit to a shared responsibility, one that is grounded in a deepened sense of empathic solidarity. This is what we need to manage the global commons more effectively. And this, dear colleagues, is what must lie at the core of a reinvigorated system of environmental multilateralism if we are to overcome the existential threats and challenges facing humanity and our planet. Thanks very much. Over back to you, John.
Thanks very much, Johanna. And, and thanks for starting us with some of the documents from uh, Stockholm 1972, because leaving the uh, gender specific language aside, you could cut and paste some of the, the language from them and just put it into today's yeah. documents yeah, and it would absolutely. resonate just deeply. So yeah. I think it, it's, it's interesting for any of us to just go back and read some of that. Uh, it's, it's a bit startling. And you've, you've really taken on a, a big issue there uh, with the challenge of national sovereignty. And I'm reminded of what Stephen Stone said earlier in his remarks about at the time when you're saying we need more um, solidarity, we're seeing a bit of a, a trend the other way and how do we reconcile some of that? And um, the national sovereignty one will be an interesting one uh, as we move forward. So thanks for that. And we're going to move to our next discussant. Uh, someone who's had a lot of experience in the UN uh, across many countries, and I think he's still based in New York. That's certainly where he was last time uh, I interacted with him, Tim Scott. Uh, Tim is the Senior Policy Advisor for Environment, Nature, Climate and Energy with UNDP, but he's also the UNDP focal point for Stockholm Plus 50. Tim, over to you. Thanks so much, Sean. Great to see you. And yes, I'm still based in New York. Uh, greetings all. Uh, let me share first just a, a few milestone successes, some of which we've, we've already heard. Um, we've succeeded in shifting the debate from a siloed environmental discussion to one that is really fully integrated, at least conceptually, through the MDGs, then Rio Plus 20, and now the 2030 agenda. So we've, we've seen a bridging and emerging of the sustainable development community on one hand and the human development community on the other. Um, exemplified by the work of Amartya Sen, uh, Mahbub al Haq, and many others. Um, as we've heard from Sherston, work around the poverty environment nexus, uh, in inclusive green economy approaches, the codification of sustainable consumption and production, and the recent global recognition of the right to a healthy environment. Many of us on this call and others take these foundational concepts as a given now, but it's taken a lot a lot to make them mainstream and to start to translate them into, into action. And the UN has, ha has had uh, a significant role in that. Second, over time, uh, we've been able to engage a much broader range of stakeholders from the private sector, civil society, and of course the public sector in ways that we haven't done in the past, not just envir environmentalist and ministries of environment, but also ministers of finance and economy, CEOs and investment managers, social media influencers, and of course, human rights activists. Uh, this is one of the underlying keys to our success going forward. Third, uh, Stephen and others have mentioned our work on ozone and the Montreal Protocol. Um, uh, this has, it, it goes without saying that this has been a major planetary success, one made possible in part by UN wide efforts by private sector engagement and the critical role of the public sector in, in ensuring a strong enabling environment. And finally, as Ivor noted a bit earlier, we've generated the evidence base needed to inform our policies and investment decisions, uh, including new measures of progress and sustainable development. These, there are many, too many to list, but they include measures around sustainability, well-being and disparity, multidimensional poverty, inclusive wealth, and newer innovations around AI, blockchain, and geospatial data. So it's a lot of successes, but what have we missed? Um, as Joanna and others have noted, we of course haven't done enough to address the direct drivers of unsustainable production. Uh, and as a result, we've, um, we've won many local battles, but are losing ground quite literally in the global battle. We failed to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 and similar pandemics just waiting around the corner. Um, and we haven't done enough to help governments and other stakeholders to set the standards and shift the incentives that we need. And among these, I want to highlight the need to phase out subsidies for the fossil fuel industry and to repurpose subsidies in the agricultural sector through a well-planned and just transition. We also know, of course, that we face a major gap between global commitments and local implementation, between our legislation at all levels and its enforcement, between constitutional and procedural rights and their full protection, whether it's for environmental defenders, for indigenous peoples and local communities, or our fellow citizens. 
finally, um, and John, I'm wrapping up here, what key lessons have we learned? Well, to succeed, to achieve the SDGs and other global environmental goals, to make peace with nature, as Joanna said at the beginning, we need to do more to scale initiatives that have already proven successful, that transform our financial and economic system in ways that redirect investment flows from nature negative to nature positive, that better align our public expenditures and the commitments on which, which they are based by changing public and market incentives, that catalyze local nature positive enterprises and green jobs, and finally that transform governance and legal systems and strengthen the rule of law and human rights instruments to safeguard the rights of people and the rights of nature and future generations. And here I'll stop. To do this, of course, we need to work together as one UN with all stakeholders. And that, of course, is the essence of what Stockholm Plus 50 is all about. So on that note, let me stop there. Thanks. And back to you, John. Great. Thanks, Tim. And uh, very insightful comments about all the interlinkages there you've raised about private sector, human rights, social media, and many more. But also the big question is how do you, you transform the system, be it incentives or law or policies, where finance is directed away from environmentally destructive activities towards um, environmentally positive activities? And that, that's a big question. It's a fundamental question. And, and hopefully um, Stockholm can help uh, offer some insights uh, into that fundamental shift uh, that you referred to, because otherwise we have a lot of little, little wins, but um, uh, we lose the overall battle, the overall game anyway. So uh, thanks for that. And we're going to move to our uh, next discussant. Um, and this is uh, Adriana Zacharias. Adriana uh, was with OECD, but then she joined UN Environment Program and she's had uh, a long history there of doing, of doing many good things. She's currently the head and global coordinator for global opportunities for the SDGs uh, with UNEP. Over to you, Adriana. Thanks, John. A pleasure to be here. Almost difficult to be. Almost the last one. Uh, so, but it's easier also because some colleagues have already said key messages. I have four key things I want to share, and I will focus more in question two on challenges and three on the lessons learned. First, I fully agree with Eduardo and Johanna on the beautiful, I think Stockholm Declaration is really beautiful, philosophical and very profound. When we read it, uh, I think as Eduardo was saying, was very ambitious, was really trying to, to put many things. And, and let me just please read my favorite paragraph six. A point has been reached in history when we must shape our actions throughout the world with a more prudent care for the environmental consequences. Through ignorance or indifference, we can do massive and irreversible harm to the environment. I use this quote a lot when I do conferences and I ask people, when do you think this UN declaration was done? And believe me, people think it was Rio plus 20 or maybe in the 90s. And now that everybody has revealed the age, I was, 10 days old when Stockholm happened. So I was a little baby. <laughs> so, and to me, we didn't hear this warning, these voices really that were looking for this, I would say already that systemic change that they were looking. If you read at the principles, yes, trade was there. It's talking about the prices of commodities. It's talking about the quality of life and, and work quality. It's talking about war, population, many, many things. And I couldn't avoid reading some of the speeches. And let me highlight the speech of Indira Gandhi was so beautiful. I think when we read that, I think everything was already said. Let's remember the 70s. It was the decade when Cluf de Rome also came and the core discussion here was limits to growth. Limits to growth. And it was really discussed and I think one key challenge that I see when I, I look back was really to understand that there was there, there are limits. I think today we are understanding these limits. In the past, it was very much like, no, 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 let's not worry about that. Technology can fix it. Or no, 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 this is an issue about population, not consumption. And I think Indira Gandhi in her speech is very clear on that. She's already talking about the difference on consumption in different countries and that the issue was not only population, but the consumption pattern. 
And let me again read another beautiful thing. Efficiency is based on the creation of goods which are not really needed and cannot be disposed and discharged properly. In Daragandi. So, and I think this is, I think what I want to highlight here, it has taken a lot of time really to, to address this issue. And why? Because consumption and production is at the core of this linear model that we embrace as development. And I see now this opportunity that we have today is really to look at this, to see the importance of consumption and production and to move more to a circular economy. And I, I guess this is um, something that will be discussed in Stockholm. Uh, I think COVID has reminded us that what was important before is origin today and has also reminded us that it's a wake up call in rethinking the economic model and also the, the social contract as Stephen was already saying. The other opportunities I see, intergeneration. Principle one already is talking about intergeneration. And I think in the last decade, we have been the race, the, the voice of women to be more strong, the, the voice of indigenous people, and lately also the power of youth. I think we need to take these voices to bring them at the table, to have this intergeneration dialogue that I know very much is what Ambassador uh, Johanna wants, wants to bring there, this inter intergeneration dialogue. And to have that, this is a uh, shared responsibility and the need for the co-creation of Stephen was saying this reimagination of the social contract. So I am very happy to be part of the task force, the, the, the group that will be supporting the coordination of Stockholm Plus 50. We will be doing regional dialogues, multi-stakeholder dialogues. And I think will be an important thing in also listening to the different voices um, in the different regions and try to bring this co-creation as I say, this reimagination of what we want. And the last message, how do I see uh, lessons learned or positive opportunities that we have? I really think that the UN reform is very good. It's helping us, it's pushing the UN agencies to work more together, to create these synergies, to avoid the duplication overlaps. And in this, um, without wanting to promote to go for SDGs, I, I want to say it is global opportunities for SDGs is a scalar of SDGs, in particular SDG 12 and 8. And the beauty of this is that we are bringing together cooperation with UNDP, with ILO, with the International Trade Union Confederation, with PAGE, with WEF, with other partners. And the idea here is how can we scale up implementation? How can we bring global solutions and the regional level that is really responding to, to the regional um, priorities and needs of the countries. And I, I think then this is opportunity for partnerships. And I like to say for copper action, it's not cooperation only, but copper action, right? We need to really scale up that implementation. So with these four messages, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriana. And I, I'm sure that Johanna, uh, there in Stockholm, we'll be delighted to hear your reference to circular economy and youth. Um, and I know that tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week, this time next week, we're going to have a number of representatives of youth uh, who are going to participate in, in the second dialogue, which is great. So thank you very much for that. Uh, good messages. And we're going to come to our final speaker for today, uh, my good friend and colleague, Jamil Ahmad. Um, Jamil had a, a long and distinguished career in Pakistan with the Foreign Service before he joined the UN. And uh, he joined the UN as Secretary of Governing Bodies, actually, when I was also in Nairobi. And uh, we worked together on international environmental governance, but we also worked together as members of the UN cricket team that took on the permanent representatives uh, to the UN in Nairobi. And I'm pleased to say Jamil and I were on the winning team. We could hand the cup to Akim Steiner to raise above his head. Um, and that's the last time that game was played. So we won the perpetual trophy. Um, Jamil is currently in New York, and he serves as the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Jamil, uh, in terms of all of our panellists and discussants today, last word over to you. Thank you, John, and uh, good to see all colleagues here. Um, when I first, uh, when I had my first brush with the Environment and UN Environment Program, Iwer Baste was uh, working on environmental governance, and that was a long time ago before we met John. So um, environmental governance has been on the uh, agenda for a very long time. And um, when we talk of 1972, 
uh, and the, the, the way the movement has come up, yes, it has come a long way. Uh, we now have a huge um, organized, structured um, governance system for, uh, for, for environmental issues uh, from the MEAs, uh, conventions, uh, the UNEP governing council, as it was called earlier now, the Environment Assembly. Um, so from the governance perspective with which I have been associated um, for many, many years, um, I think we have um, something to celebrate, uh, but uh, celebration is not enough. Um, that celebration stops when we comes to um, the reality uh, of, of today's uh, environmental problems. Um, we have had so many conventions, uh, Montreal and chemicals and mercury are cited as a success. Uh, but that success was because of a convergence of interests of all those players, not just of science. Science is there for climate also, but it's not working. Science is there for uh, biodiversity also, but it has not worked. So what is it that makes it work? Um, and Eduardo, I think, mentioned, uh, alluded to it uh, in some way. Um, there is, um, I think, lack of uh, level playing field, if I was to uh, use a sports uh, term for uh, the developed and developing countries. Um, we see uh, that the challenges of the current economic paradigm, uh, to which I think Stephen Stone also meant, referred and Eduardo and others, uh, it makes it um, very difficult uh, for other countries and other players to contribute um, as much as they would wish to. Um, they are constrained, uh, not because of their own lack of their own political will, but because of the um, challenges that are imposed um, on the system, on their system, on their governance structures uh, from above. So if you are talking of uh, environmental stream and trade stream and that it should merge, yes, it should merge, but it should merge in a way that gives everybody an equal opportunity to grow. And uh, that, that has been um, a missing link. Um, and if, if Stockholm can, can take stock of that um, next year, Perhaps that will be one way of uh, trying to bring some balance into this work. Um, another um, factor which um, has come out in a positive term because of the uh, challenges that we face is the growth of a global uh, environmental movement, uh, global environmental activism. Um, we see teenagers um, as young as Greta and non-agenarians as old as uh, as, as, as uh, Attenborough um, are now on one page, uh, uh, whether on the streets or whether inside the conference room. And that can, have, can, can be converted into some sort of a, um, some sort of a force in support of the international environmental governance. Um, on the uh, COVID has perhaps told, uh, ex explained to us and, and demonstrated to us how we are one people but how we are not one people. Uh, the vaccine uh, issue has demonstrated that we still don't feel like a global community. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when we talk of climate and environment and biodiversity and other issues, we always talk uh, that yes, we should be one global community and there's a deep sense of global solidarity, but that evaporates as soon as we go to the brass tacks. So what is it that is missing? Um, we should uh, use Stockholm plus 50 for that opportunity. And I think Johanna mentioned a, a system change. So that system change should begin with this thought process. Um, the discussion about uh, national sovereignty will come uh, much, much, much later. Um, at this stage, I think we need to see how we can start implementation of the pledges and commitments and undertakings and, and, and conventions and declarations that we have piled and piled and piled. Um, John's uh, computer would not be able to download that uh, um, it's more happier than geo geo so um this uh, is a, a, a ground reality and i think we need to uh, we need to give some thought to it some brainstorming on this also will be um, will be will be in uh, required um, i don't know if uh, i would say more at this point but i think um, stockholm plus 50 should be used uh, uh, as an open opportunity. Multilateralism is the um, need of the time, yes, uh, but 
to uh, it should be inclusive as SDGs were. Uh, SDGs was perhaps the first big example of an inclusive multilateralism uh, without uh, breaking the rules of intergovernmental processes. And that model, um, perhaps for the time being, will serve well. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jamil. And um, I, I think your comment about a lack of level playing field was certainly picked up by Eduardo and uh, and several others during their their commentaries. And I think we picked up from others that there, there's well we're feeling the need to come together to deal with these issues. There are a whole lot of issues to do, including the inequities from COVID nineteen that are sort of pulling us apart when we need to be pulled together. Uh, so there's a bit of a, a push and pull there. And on the on the youth, I know that uh, Johanna was very keen on this. And an interesting point about uh, um, people with very different spectrums of their, their life, uh, young and old, um, and how do we capture the enthusiasm and the energy of the youth and combine it with the wisdom one would hope that comes with age and, and see generations come together uh, rather than seeing them as pulling in opposite directions, as you've highlighted. In fact, we find that they're like-minded and pulling in the same direction. So how do we capture that? and uh, get that energy coming out of Stockholm plus 50. So it's about quarter to four my time. We've got about 15 minutes left. We will have a few closing remarks from a few individuals, but it does give us an opportunity to ask a few questions. <laughs> I was just handed a phone that had some questions that have been downloaded, but it went uh, black. Okay, here we go. So we have a question that's related to the decision taken by Human Rights Council on the 8th of October of this year. Uh, recognizing a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. And the question is, how can universal recognition of the right to a healthy environment inform Stockholm Plus 50 and strengthen future environmental action? Now, I'm going to have to uh, go to someone to take this, but can I see if there's any participant online that would like to take that? Just put your hand up and I'll throw it to you. And I can see Johanna would like to take that. And if any others would like to comment as well, and Tim as well. So go Johanna and then Tim. Thanks, John. I'll answer that in the context of how I, the human rights-based approach has been so critical in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework negotiations. And what's been amazing, because I've been involved in this process for the last 18 months with the post-2020 partnership, is that in the last 18 months, we have seen over and over again a confluence of support from the human rights community, from the big conservation NGOs for a human rights-based approach lying at the core of the global biodiversity framework. And it means that you can't, again, it's all about the just and effective transition. It's not just about global goals for nature. It's not just about nature-based solutions, but it's about nature-based solutions that are equitable, that are just, that recognize the, the rights of all the other rights holders and the stakeholders. And I think that it's been a pivotal mo moment this last 18 months for the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples, especially in light of the, the incredible human rights violations that they face um, on protected areas. So I think this is a, a watershed moment. And I think that um, the global biodiversity framework is gonna be an important beacon in terms of how the rights-based approach is an absolute prerequisite um, for any future global environmental policy making process. And I think Stockholm Plus 50 can really um, you know, give a tremendous impulse. And I just want to also say shout out to David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur. He's been, he is a force for nature, the best possible force for nature I can think of. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rupert. Anna. And is that a shift you saw from Stockholm 1972 to Stockholm 2022? Yeah, it is because Stockholm never actually recognized an international right to human environment. There's lunches lead to believe there that you know, the groundwork was being laid. The irony is that um, whilst there was debate at the international level, many, many, many countries around the world embedded environmental rights in their national constitutions. Regional um, um, uh, instruments also recognize like the EC charter. And it's only 
in this last year that that right has been crystallized at the international level. And I think it's gonna be a game changer because it's gonna provide legal standing for local communities to bring forth legal action against their governments, against other corporate interests that are that are violating um, environmental protection laws. So Stockholm, in answer to your question, the language was there, but it wasn't framed as an international human right. Thanks, Johanna. And Tim, you wanted to add to this, if any other colleague wanted to add to this, just raise your hand. If not, I'll move to the next question. Thanks, John. Yeah, it was an excellent question. And uh, just to compliment what Joanna said. So yeah, over 150 jurisdictions at the regional and national level already recognize to varying degrees the right to a healthy environment prior to the recent global, um, uh, global resolution, which is, which is not to understate its importance. I wanted to highlight just two other points. Um, Almost, uh, let's see, 30 years ago, uh, as part of the uh, original Rio conference, um, the uh, what are called the uh, Bali uh, Principle 10 uh, Bali guidelines, uh, as many of us know, kind of codified the important procedural rights, which are key to implementing uh, global normative rights like the right to a healthy environment. And for those of us who don't know, these are procedural rights that are. Uh, about access to information, access to public participation, and access to justice, uh, whether it's for environmental defenders or other groups. And I just wanted to really highlight the importance of embedding these procedural rights in all of the work that the UN and our partners support. And a final thought before giving back to you, John, um, the engagement uh, plans in place for Stockholm Plus 50, uh, not only through the work of the EMG, but through many, many other efforts at the global, regional, and national level to engage stakeholders um, uh, really exemplifies efforts by the UN to make sure that these important procedural rights for participation are put into practice for Stockholm Plus 50 itself. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Tim. I'm just going to move to uh, another rather specific question. It's how can social and humanitarian challenges related to the triple planetary crisis be linked to financial tools and solutions. Who would like to have, I can see Stephen, I was expecting your hand up and Jan. Stephen, and then we'll go to Jan. Okay, thanks, John. And uh, thanks for the conversation. You know, it just keeps getting better. I really liked, uh, Adriana, what you were saying about the principles. And of course, Johanna, hearing you there in the, in the front uh, rows of Stockholm. Um, so there's a lot of movement in the financial industry. Now we're seeing, a massive amount of interest in uh, the net zero, the global alliance for net zero that uh, coalesced around Glasgow uh, about two weeks ago. But that's actually not new. I mean, UNEPFI, which was created, it's gonna have its 30th anniversary um, in 2022. It's been around for a long time and they are really lifting the bar on sustainability standards for the financial services industry. So there's a lot of drivers. And the reason we look at finance is because it's a leading indicator. We know the investment of today shapes the world of tomorrow. So it's an easy one to track and it's getting a lot more rigorous, a lot more tied to the science as well, John. So it's very promising. Um, I think the question for Stockholm plus 50 will be, how do we bring those people into the conversation, right? Through the leadership dialogues and perhaps leadership dialogue three on accelerating the means of implementation is a very good space or leadership dialogue two on a sustainable inclusive recovery. We need to have finance in the room along with key businesses so that actually that's a conversation, not just with private sector or private uh, civil society, but also with the private sector. So those are just some thoughts, John, but very promising move uh, so far. Thanks, Stephen. And can you, can you tell me this, you know, when you read the media and a lot of things you pick up, it suggests that, you know, we are seeing a shift in the, in the private sector and finance sector in particular that we haven't seen before. As you said, the finance initiative has been around for 30 years, but with all your experience, are you seeing that there is a, sort of um, a change? Is the penny dropping with the finance sector in particular now that um, we have all the climate science and everything that's happening with the, you know, the youth move and everything else? Are things starting to shift? You know, it's, it's getting harder to sort of create the shadows. That's what we're seeing. There's a lot of transparency on how the money is flowing and where it's flowing. And so because of that, you're seeing a lot more um, advocacy on boards. You might remember there was a lot of uh, advocacy around oil and gas boards recently about how they're investing in the responsibilities for climate change as well. 
So I think we are seeing a real shift. And the other thing is on coal, you know, financing coal is now seen as something you just don't do anymore. Um, and that's a real sort of cultural shift as well, which is shaping finance. So I think attitudes are changing and finance is responding. Yeah. Well, you made the example of uh, smoking before, but um, a lot of people still smoke, unfortunately. Um, so there's also a role for regulation, I think. And um, that's one that I think it, uh, ought to be discussed about. Um, there's the leaders in the, in the game, but how do you pick up the laggards? And sometimes yeah. they need a regulatory push in the right direction. But that's a discussion for another day. And Jan, uh, you wanted to comment on this one as well. Yes, because I read the question in the, in the Q&A and I thought that maybe it's just a question for clarification about something I said in my intervention. So in the humanitarian sector, we're seeing that um, actors are now using new instruments. I said financial instruments, but it's actually risk management tools to forecast disasters like droughts or floods, set money aside and dispense the money in advance. So before the disaster hit, People. And this is, can be much more cost effective than actually um, reacting to the disaster exposed. So maybe this is uh, what I wanted to clarify. Mm. Excellent. Thanks for that clarification. And we, we have some uh, generic questions that are coming through around youth involvement. And I know that this is something that uh, Sweden was very keen on and Jana was very keen on that. How do you involve youth in the conference? And I'd like to, to reach out to you to offer some insights. I mean, you've been involved around UN processes and all sorts of meetings for a long time. How can you involve youth in a meaningful way in Stockholm plus 50? Um, who'd like to offer some, uh, some insights there? Jamil? Uh, thank you. Out. Thank you, John. I think there are mechanisms already in place in the UN system for engaging with youth. Uh, the Secretary General has a Youth Advisory Council. <clears throat> he has also announced that, uh, and I'm not sure if he's already done that, that there will be a youth um, separate youth uh, office, which will coordinate youth engagement across the UN system. Um, UNEP has its own uh, youth involvement assembly uh, and other engagement with youth. So there are mechanisms and avenues available to engage youth uh, in these uh, processes. And that can be channelized into um, um, providing uh, for, for providing for obtaining the views of youth of uh, Stockholm Plus 50 and other uh, UN um, um, processes that are currently under on the way underway. Thank you. Thanks, Jamila. John, this is. Can I come in and just comment on that also? Yes, uh, Johanna, I was going to come to you for some general observations as well. Can I just go to Adriana and then I'll come to you, Johanna, because you'll have the last word before we wrap up. Adriana. Well, I think uh, Ambassador Lissinger will say, <laughs> but I will not say what she's going to say. <laughs> uh, from UNEP, I think, uh, and responding to also your question, youth is very important. And I, uh, if we look at the three planetary crises, we are saying that the root cause of this is our unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. So therefore, youth have a very important role here in helping shaping and as we are saying, reimagining the future. What are these, those future lifestyles that we want? How do we see mobility in a more sustainable way where we don't need a private car, but what we need is mobility. How can they push to have more sustainable food? How can we change to uh, different diets that are less uh, animal protein based? And um, how can we also look at more sustainable fashion, etc.? So what I want to say is, as citizens in general, but more as youth, they have the power in shaping these lifestyles, in reinventing that. And the other one, I think, as we are saying, is a shared responsibility. So it will not fair, be fair just to say, oh, now is the new generation that needs to, to solve this. So I think it's important that they link also to their local governments to work also with the private sector in also helping in the speeding up supply for more sustainable products and services. And also as we see in many cities, how young people are pushing governments to have more bicycle lanes, more green areas, vegetable gardens, et cetera, and creating this alternative. For Stockholm engagement, I'm sure Ambassador will answer that. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adriana. And Johanna, I'd like to invite you to respond to this 
sort of it was a generic question because I was told there were many questions on this theme, but also we're coming to the end and also invite you to, to make any other observations regarding what you've heard today. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think I'll, I'll keep it actually quite short because I think for the general observations, we have a session also next week. So I think maybe starting off that session with kind of reflecting on what we heard today uh, and bring that in as a starting point next week um, is maybe just more, more helpful than trying to repeat some of what has been said. But let me do two things first, uh, or three things actually. I did notice also in the question that there was a lot of comments on uh, indigenous peoples and involvement in preparations for Circle Plus 50. This is of course something that is also uh, key for us. I don't know what the panel looks like next week, but uh, there may be an opportunity for next week's sessions to also bring in the indigenous people's perspective. And I see Lisa Hussain is, is nodding. Uh, on the youth, um, I think Adriana spoke quite a lot on, on different issues there, but for Stockholm, we did during uh, the Glasgow Climate COP launch a youth task force uh, that will provide uh, input, insights to the Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, it's, it's a process where the youth community through the children and uh, major groups in, in Nairobi is organizing themselves, has hired a call on participants uh, from the youth sector to provide input to, to the youth. So this is something that is important for us. But I think it's important in different levels. First of all, it's, it's participation and participation in leading up to the process. Uh, but it's also on how do we address the different policy issues that has been brought up to the table and put those questions in a matter that is relevant for the future of the youth. What is the aspect in redefining humankind's relationship to nature where the youth is also the solution providers, not through taking over the responsibilities, but through also uh, addressing the issues with solutions. And it's, it's easy, and we do this because we have to do it in, in one way or another, but the youth is also a very diverse group. Um, and for example, how do we engage um, not just the organized youth community, but youth professionals? And the other answer, which I usually get, you know, when I get the question, how can we engage leading up to Stockholm Plus 50? My response is also, you know, engage with, with your own government, engage with the business community in, in your country and your constituency to put, the ta put, put on the table the questions that been, have been discussed here today. And that is very much on the focus on, on Stockholm Plus 50. So um, I think engaging us youth community in processes is not just engaging a specific process, but it's engaging also with your constituency in the country where you live. Uh, to put these questions uh, high up on the agenda. Uh, the general reflection, I think, will be very short. I think a lot of really, really interesting things have, have been said, and I'm taking careful notes. Um, I think many spoke on different ways of the redefining humankind's relationship to nature. So um, I think in the forward-looking path next uh, week, and I don't want to change your agenda, but uh, I hear this a lot. But I also, when I speak about this, I also, you know, have the reaction, let's say 50% of people saying, yes, this is exactly what we need to do. And then another group saying, what do you mean with changing humankind's relationship to nature? Um, so I think also we have a task ahead of us of making that phrase understandable for those who may not have a long history in environmental governance, in climate or in biodiversity. But what does it mean for, and, and many have spoken about this, what does it mean for the humanitarian side? What does it mean for the finance sector? What does it mean for budgeting within governments? So, you know, finding those building blocks of redefining humankind's relationship to nature in a way that it feels relevant uh, if you are a government representative, if you are a business representative, if you represent maybe the future of, of jobs agenda, and also making it relevant to the north um, and south perspective, which I think Jamal also spoke very much about. So, for next week, in looking forward, uh, being visionary but concrete uh, in how do we redefine humankind's relationship to nature. Thank you, John.
Wonderful. Thanks, Johanna. And message received loud and clear. And you'll have an opportunity next week to uh, also make an opening statement. And I've no doubt you'll pick up on that. I will leave it to Hussein to respond to you on the agenda for next week, but I think that's what he says. And I'm going to take your lead, given the hour, to not try and summarise what we've heard today. We can pick that up at the beginning of next, uh, next week's uh, session. But I think, Johanna, what we saw today is you laid out a bit of a challenge. You laid out three areas or pose three questions where we can make a difference. You asked us to look at interlinkages uh, within the environmental domain, but also outside of it with all the other sectors you've made reference to. And how can we change the system, the biggest system? And I think that all of our panelists and uh, discussants have picked up exactly on all of those issues in a very rich and enlightening discussion that I know has been of, of great uh, interest to everyone sitting in this room, uh, representing the EMG Secretariat, and they'll capture it and we'll carry it forward into the preparatory process. Uh, so thank you very much. And do tune in same time, same channel next week when we're going to look to the future and pick up Johanna's challenge. And I'm going to hand over to my good friend and colleague Hussein uh, to wrap it up and uh, let us know what we have planned for next week. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, colleagues and friends. Um, we have passed already uh, three minutes uh, beyond four, so I'm not going to conclude anything here or make a summary. It has been uh, so useful to listen to these uh, insights, these thought, uh, thoughts and uh, ideas and perspectives and experiences. I am humbly thankful to all of you, uh, in particular you, John, and um, Ambassador Rihanna and, 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 and the other colleagues uh, for taking your time and attending this dialogue. Very shortly, we will be preparing a summary of this uh, discussion, as well as the recording of this also will be available for those who have not had time to, to attend. So that will be um, made available soon and I'll, it will be put on our website. Uh, with regards to the next uh, part and second part of the dialogue, as uh, you said, John, we have really tried to bring representatives from the youth groups. Uh, we have tried uh, to have a mix of veterans, youth, uh, UN colleagues, uh, we have also tried to uh, make sure that perspectives from the North as well as the South are on the table, uh, as well as the gender parity, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. A, a, a large number of criteria and in sort of to, to make sure that uh, we have not uh, left anyone behind. Uh, your uh, request and comments with regards to having a representative from indigenous community has been well received. We will do our utmost to have also a representative from their side to be included into the dialogue. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we will not limit uh, our uh, gathering of perspectives only to these two Nexus dialogues. We'll be reaching out to uh, uh, UN system through individual interviews, through uh, tapping into various networks uh, that are working uh, on the environment in one way or another in order to really and make sure that we have uh, tapped into diverse sets of ideas and perspectives. Uh, with that, I would very much like to thank you all again for your time. Please do share the link of this Nexus Dialogue to your respective uh, networks for the next one. Uh, we have had a good attendance uh, to this one. We hope to have it increased for the second one. Uh, and as I said, we will really make sure that this is also shared through other uh, channels and so that everybody has uh, benefited from it. Thank you very much for that. If, uh, with your permission, John, if I may, uh, thank you all of you, wishing you a very good continuation of the day or, or a week and look forward to meeting with all of you next week on the 30th of uh, November at the same time, uh, two o'clock Geneva time, European Central time. Thank you very much and have a lovely uh, end of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers.